Welcome back to Intro to Philosophy 1010. The book is The World of Philosophy, an Introductory Reader by Stephen Kahn, and we're going over John Dewey, his reflections on democracy. And this is in preparation for exam five, so it's part A, question one, of Plato, Hobbes, Marx, Mill, and Dewey, which presents the better argument of the relationship of the state to society. And part B, explain Dewey's defense of democracy. So Dewey, I'll read these introductory notes. I, I've read Dewey before, I believe, but I've never studied Dewey, so, um, so let me just read these background notes for some context. John Dewey, 1859 to 1952, was the foremost American philosopher of the first half of the 20th century. Born and bred in Burlington, Vermont, his life and thought reflected the commitment to social equality he found exemplified in the life of his boyhood New England community. He spent most of his career as a professor of philosophy at Columbia University. This is a reprint from a talk given in 1937 to a meeting of educational administrators. So he is an advocate of democracy in a much broader sense than just its political form. He thinks the spirit of egalitarianism should infuse every aspect of social life. So what's the relationship between state and society? He's saying they need to be woven together with this sincere faith in the human power of pooled intelligence to bring about the most just way of life. And I would say he's a liberal philosopher in the sense that he's more of a humanist than someone, for example, like Plato, who would say that a just society depends on being ruled by those extremely well-educated individuals with a natural aptitude for philosophy <clears throat> who have opened the eye of the soul to the idea of the good, this transcendental source of light and consciousness that society will only be well organized when the state is run by those philosopher kings. Dewey's the opposite of that. And I'm going to read a little bit from Plato's Republic. We had, we read Plato's Republic already, but the excerpt from the Republic that I think most perfectly opposes what Dewey says here, I'll read some of that after, but to give Ju uh, John Dewey his time on page 465 on the left. He says, democracy is much broader than a special political form, a method of conducting government, of making laws, and carrying on governmental administration by means of popular suffrage and elected officers. It is that, of course, but it is something broader and deeper than that. <clears throat> the political and governmental phase of democracy is a means, the best means so far found, for realizing ends that lie in the wide domain of human relationships and the development of human personality. All right, so right there, the development of human personality. Democracy is intended to develop human personality. When I read that, I was thinking, is that the case or is democracy the form of government that says, let every individual decide for him or herself what kind of a human personality they should develop into. Is it the role of democracy to develop human personality? I think this is, um, so at any rate, this is putting democracy, he's going to go on to say you shouldn't worship uh, false idols, but it seems to me he's, he's worshiping democracy itself. And so I'll, I'll come to that point when he, when he talks about the foundations of democracy. It's, it's not the belief in a creator God endowing humans with unalienable rights, which is the foundation of American democracy. John Dewey, an American philosopher, very obviously does not accept that as the foundation, but rather human nature. He's much more of a humanist. So he says, the, the, um, so he, it, he says it is, as we often say, uh, though perhaps without appreciating all that is involved in the saying, a way of life, social and individual. The key note of democracy is a way of life, 
may be expressed, it seems to me, as the necessity for the participation of every mature human being in formation of the values that regulate the living of men together, which is necessary from the standpoint of both the general social welfare and the full development of human beings as individuals. So he believes for a human being to become fully developed, every mature human being needs to participate in forming the values that regulate them all. So again, that would Plato would not agree, um, and although Plato would say that every every person has to participate in the society, but as far as determining what are the values that that society should follow, definitely Plato would say only those who are educated properly to see everything rooted in the absolute idea of the good would have that power, but. Dewey is saying, no, the power of pooled intelligence is what will really bring us to this full development as human beings. So he says that universal suffrage, recurring elections, responsibility of those who are in political power to the voters, and the other factors of democratic government are means that have been found expedient for realizing democracy as the truly human way of living. So I'm going to skip a little bit here. De democratic political forms are simply the best means that human wit has devised up to a special time in history. All right, you know what? I should have read this other one. Uh, they are not the final end and a final value. These ideas of voting for your elected representatives, they're not the final end and a final value. They are to be judged on the basis of their contribution to an end. It is a form of idolatry to erect means into the end which they, which they serve. Democratic political forms are simply the best means that human wit has devised up to a special time in history, but they rest back upon the idea that no man or limited set of men is wise enough or good enough to rule others without their consent. So that's the, the end, that the political means of our constitutional form of government, they, they shouldn't be worshipped. That would be idolatry. What should be worshipped, it would appear to me he's saying, is the faith in the in human beings to collectively decide what is good and to consent among themselves. That, I would say that is a form of idolatry to worship this democratic model of the human being as the ultimate truly human way of living. I think that is a form of idolatry as we saw with John Stuart Mill on liberty, you know, because okay, even if everyone on earth today agrees with that, Certainly people in the past didn't all agree with that, and are we wiser than they necessarily, and will people in the future all agree to that? And despite that fact, not everyone on the, on the earth agrees with that fact, that democracy and the democratic model of a human being is the ultimate pinnacle of human achievement. Um, to me, that seems like idolatry. I agree that democracy is the best form of government available to us today, given the circumstances that we're in, but for all time, at all places, I don't agree with what he's saying there, but uh, so this is why he's, he's taking a strong position and he's trying to defend it here. So he goes, the two facts that each one is influenced in what he does and enjoys and in what he becomes by the institutions under which he lives, and that therefore he shall have in a democracy a voice in shaping them are the passive and active sides of the same fact. So he's just saying, when you had in the past a social arrangement in, in which the power and the decisions for everything came from above, uh, that was just a form of despotism, even if it's a benevolent despotism. He says on page 466 on the left, it gives individuals no opportunity to reflect and decide upon what is good for them. Others who are supposed to be wiser and who in any case have more power decide the question for them. All right, so he's saying that is what we need to evolve from. And then it's when the whole social body contributes to developing the values. He says this is what is required. And the one thing he'll say, maybe it's true, he goes, the mass usually become unaware that they have a claim to a development of their own powers. Their experience is so restricted that they are not conscious of restriction it is a part of the democratic conception that they as individuals are not the only sufferers, but that the whole social body is deprived of the potential resources that should be at its service. The individuals of the submerged mass may not be very wise, 
But there is one thing they are wiser about than anybody else can be, and that is where the shoe pinches, the troubles they suffer from. All right, so he's saying even if the majority of human beings are not well-educated enough to contribute the finer points of public policy, at least they can tell you one thing very clearly, where the social system is hurting them in particular, so that those who might be trained in public policy would at least need to consult the majority of people to say, where is the system most flawed? Where is it most troubling? So then he'll go on to say on page 466, the left-hand column at the bottom, the foundation of democracy is faith in the capacities of human nature. So, so right there, that's an important claim. He believes that the foundation of democracy is faith in the capacities of human nature, faith in human intelligence and in the power of pooled and cooperative experience. It is not belief that these things are complete, but that if given a show, they will grow and be able to generate progressively the knowledge and wisdom needed to guide collective action. Every autocratic and authoritarian scheme of social action rests on a belief that the needed intelligence is confined to a superior few who, because of inherent natural gifts, are endowed with the ability and the right to control the conduct of others, laying down principles and rules and directing the ways in which they are carried out. All right, so we're going to go back because this is kind of packed with important points and he's going to continue with more important points. But let's just focus on his claim that the foundation of democracy is faith in the capacities of human nature. I think that is true. But as I mentioned earlier, the true foundation of democracy in America is the Declaration of Independence where it is claimed that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are the, uh, the rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, I didn't exactly quote it properly, but the point is this. There's some omnipotent, universal creator who endows each of us with certain unalienable rights, no matter how many people in a, in a democracy might decide, hey, you know what, you don't have that right, or, or um, basically you don't have that individual right, the foundation of this democracy is there are certain rights that nobody can say you don't have, even a majority, that humans can't come up with a better explanation for why these rights should be taken away. So the foundation of democracy is not just faith in human nature, but also faith in the existence of these miraculous thing called uh, these miraculous things called natural rights. So when he he's talking about it's all based on human intelligence and the power of pooled intelligence, there's no foundation for the idea of natural rights. And that is a problem when you focus just on human beings and equality and don't bring in some kind of a absolute foundation of the standards of right and wrong, which Plato does with the idea of the good. And it does seem against the egalitarian way of thinking to assume that any human being could have possession of these absolute standards of right and wrong. So there is this tension between the belief in uh, all-powerful monarchical creator God endowing us with unalienable rights and the egalitarianism of democracy. There is a tension there. It seems to me Dewey is leaning away in favor of human intelligence and away from the idea of a transcendental intelligence, which he doesn't even mention. And he does mention the church, but he says it must also bend the knee to the spirit of democracy. So continuing, um, and when he went on to talk about that this autocratic authoritarian scheme talks about a superior few with inherent natural gifts, that's definitely what Plato said in the Republic on page 438. He said that, he says, so it is our business to define if we can, the natural gifts that fit men to be guardians of a commonwealth. Then Glaucon, how are the men of that natural disposition to be kept from behaving pugnaciously to one another? So that what are the natural, the native aptitudes, uh, the natural gifts of the guardian class? So that is what 
Socrates in the Republic said the purpose of a well-organized state is to be able to sift through all the people in the society, no matter what to what families they were born, and discover those with the most natural talent for becoming rulers. And that doesn't completely go against what Dewey's saying here, because at least the superior few are found by looking throughout the entire range of the population, not just some inherited birthright or some particular caste. Plato wants to establish a caste system. There's no democracy whatsoever. And he was writing in a, in a democratic state of Athens, nominally democratic. They had slaves and women couldn't vote, but at least the men, the free men in Athens, they all had a vote. It was a direct democracy as opposed to a representative democracy. But the democratic element in that was everybody gets a chance to run for the highest, not to run for the highest offices, but to be chosen for being trained to become worthy rulers. All right, continuing here on the bottom of 466 on the left, he says, it would be foolish to deny that much can be said for this point of view, the idea that a trained elite should rule. It is that which controlled human relations and social groups for much the greater part of human history. The democratic faith has emerged very, very recently in the history of mankind. When he said that, the democratic faith, well, it was there in Athens, at least to some degree. So that's very, very far back in history at the foundation of Western civilization. But I guess he wasn't considering or he was dismissing Athens as a, as a model of democracy. Skipping down on the right-hand column, after democratic political institutions were nominally established, beliefs and ways of looking at life and of acting that originated when men and women were externally controlled and subjected to arbitrary power persisted in the family, the church, business, and the school. And experience shows that as long as they persist there, political democracy is not secure. So there, where he's saying that to me, this sounds like demo the spirit of democracy overreaching itself. The uh, beliefs and ways of looking at life and of acting that originated when men and women were externally controlled and subjected to arbitrary power persisted in the, the family, the church, businesses, and the school. So the family started, the family as a unit started before democracy, and it is carried with it these pre-democratic sensibilities which render democracy insecure. Okay, so well, what was the structure of a family? As a father and a mother and children. And we're gonna see other writers say also, yes, this is a form of oppression. It's the patriarchal family structure, which is mirrored by the patriarchal church structure, which permeates the school and business as well, and this needs to be dismantled. So there's a lot, of, a lot to be said for the abuses that have occurred under a patriarchal, hierarchical social system. But on the other hand, to say that the democratic spirit is this panacea and it deserves to be everywhere also seems to me to be a big overreach. So how is democracy supposed to be established in a family? I can see it being established between a mother and a father, but the mother and the father can't take the majority vote in most cases with children who aren't well developed enough to make sound decisions. We're going to see uh, that comment being uh, made later in the book. Uh, so in what ways would that be the case? Um, and for the church, okay, you've got a minister with a, with a position of authority and then the congregation. And in the Catholic Church especially, there's all a rigid and very well-defined hierarchy. He's saying this, this, the existence of those institutions in a democracy render the democracy insecure. So that just seems to me to be pushing the boundaries um, too far. Who, who's to say that, you know? Certainly not the pooled intelligence of all Americans would agree with that. It seems to me a rather rarefied idea that um, some kind of a superior few might consider themselves to be coming up with, but, so I'll just continue here on the right-hand column, 466. Belief in equality is an element of the democratic credo. It is not, however, belief in equality of natural endowments. All right, so here's where he's moderating this potential of democracy, democracy to become so all-consuming that the virtue of egalitarianism 
demands not only equality of opportunity, but equality of condition for everyone, regardless of whether they're willing to pull their weight or not. Everyone should be given the same exact amount, no matter what their natural difference is. That is when you take the democratic sense of equality to an extreme, and I think he's trying to moderate that tendency. He says, belief in equality is an element of the democratic credo. It is not, however, belief in equality of natural endowments. Those who proclaimed the idea of equality did not suppose they were enunciating a psychological doctrine, but a legal and political one. All individuals are entitled to equality of treatment by law and in its administration. A little bit lower, he says, in short, each one is equally an individual and entitled to equal opportunity of development of his own capacities, be they large or small in range. Moreover, each has needs of his own as significant to him as those of others are to them. The very fact of natural and psychological inequality is all the more reason for establishment by law of equality of opportunity, since otherwise the former becomes a means of oppression of the less gifted. So the very fact that there are these natural inequalities is the best reason to ensure an equality of opportunity, so that the really smart people and the really strong people don't tyrannize over and enslave the less intelligent and the less physically powerful people. So then he goes on to say, while what we call intelligence be distributed in unequal amounts, it is the democratic faith that it is sufficiently general so that each individual has something to contribute whose value can be assessed only as it enters into the final pooled intelligence constituted by the contributions of all. So right there is this idea of pooled intelligence. We saw it earlier on page 466 in the left-hand column. This is the foundation of democracy, the faith in the power of pooled intelligence, that if you include the opinions of everybody, as many people as possible, that's going to give you the best guiding light towards developing the best kind of a human being. Every authoritarian scheme, on the, on the contrary, assumes that its value may be assessed by some prior principle, if not of family and birth or race and color or possession of material wealth, then by the position and rank a person occupies in the existing social scheme. The democratic faith in equality is the faith that each individual shall have the chance and opportunity to contribute whatever he is capable of contributing, and that the value of his contribution be decided by its place and function in the organized total of similar contributions, not on the basis of prior status of any kind whatsoever. So, the freedom of intelligence is what he's going to talk about next on page 467, the left-hand column. He says, while the idea is not always, not often enough expressed in words, the basic freedom is that of freedom of mind and of whatever degree of freedom of action and experience is necessary to produce freedom of intelligence. Continuing a little bit, well, I'll just read. He says, the modes of freedom guaranteed in the Bill of Rights are all of this nature, freedom of belief and conscience, of expression, of opinion, of assembly for discussion and conference, of the press as an organ of communication. They are guaranteed because without them, individuals are not free to develop and society is deprived of what they might contribute. Continuing on 467 on the right-hand column, he says, there is some kind of government of control wherever affairs that concern a number of persons who act together are engaged in, in a superficial view that holds government is located in Washington and Albany, there is government in the family, in business, in the church, in every social group. All right, so here's the point that I find controversial. There's government, it pervades all of human social interaction. It's in the family, in business, in the church, in every social group. There are regulations due to custom, if not to enactment, that settle how individuals in a group act in connection with one another. He goes, it is a disputed question of theory and practice just how far democratic political government should go in control of the conditions of action within special groups. So, should they have any control at all to go and tell people of the member of a religious group how they should interact with each other in their own church? I would say that that's not really, you know, unless they're performing human sacrifices or torturing animals or something. So then, you know, some amount of regulation, but how much? So he says, at the present time, for example, there are those who think the federal and state government leave too much freedom of independent action to industrial and financial groups. And there are others who think that government is going altogether too far at the present time. 
I do not need to discuss this phase of the problem much less to try to settle it, but it must be pointed out that if the methods of regulation and administration in vogue in the conduct of secondary social groups are non-democratic, whether directly or indirectly or both, there is bound to be an unfavorable reaction back into the habits of feeling, thought, and action of citizenship in the broadest sense of that word. The way in which any organized social interest is controlled necessarily plays an important part in forming the dispositions and tastes, the attitudes, interests, purposes, and desires of those engaged in carrying on the activities of the group. For illustration, I do not need to do more than point to the moral, emotional, and intellectual effect upon both employers and laborers of the existing industrial system. All right, so he's focusing on the industrial system. What's the social relationships in the industrial system? Well, according to Karl Marx, as we saw, you've got the owners of capital telling the laborers what to do. It's a one way, you do this, here's how much you're going to get paid. I don't need your input, just fulfill your function as a cog in the machine, and that's all we desire from you. Not very democratic, would have an eroding effect on society in general. How far can the government go in there and say, oh, you can't do that, you've got to have labor unions, and there's got to be a more of a democratic spirit about this. Okay, that's something that should be addressed. Then you get to the matter of the church, and I just keep thinking, let me just, instead of just thinking here, and I've, I've got a bit of a time restraint, but um, this is from Alexis de Tocqueville, where he talks about this issue of the relationship between the spirit of democracy and religion. And this is from, uh, what is this, Volume 2, Democracy in America. I'll just read a brief excerpt here. He says, all the American clergy know and respect the intellectual supremacy exercised by the majority. This is in a democracy in America. They never sustain any but necessary conflicts with it. They take no share in the altercations of parties. Well, they do now, but they readily adopt the general opinions of their country and their age, and they allow themselves to be borne away without opposition in the current of feeling and opinion by which everything around them is carried along. They endeavor to amend their contemporaries, but they do not quit fellowship with them. Public opinion is therefore never hostile to them. It, it is to some degree now in some quarters. It rather supports and protects them, and their belief owes its authority at the same time to the strength which is its own and to that which it borrows from the opinions of the majority. That Thus it is that by respecting all democratic tendencies not absolutely contrary to herself, and by making use of several of them for her own purposes, religion sustains a successful struggle with that spirit of individual independence, which is her most dangerous opponent. Then he'll go on to talk about the progress of Roman Catholicism in the United States. And he says, I am inclined to believe that the number of these thinkers will be less in democratic ages than in others, and that our posterity will tend more and more to a division into only two parts, some relinquishing Christianity entirely and others returning to the Church of Rome. So he believes that as a counterbalance to the tendency of a democracy to become too egalitarian in the sense of demanding a leveling of everybody and a, and a suppression of natural talents, that you need the spirit of religion to balance that and a spirit of, of surrendering your will to the supreme authority of God. That's what... De Tocqueville said, this is what keeps America and a democracy from veering into some tyranny of the majority too overtly or too swiftly. He thinks it would be inevitable it eventually will happen, but it's their Christian faith that provides this non-governmentally enforced counterbalance to the inclinations of democracy to overstep the bounds of religious liberty, for example, or liberty of association. And, and, and this seems to me what John Dewey's pointing to here is that there are these eroding effects of these secondary social groups like industrial groups and the church and family itself. So how far should this government restructure the family? Should the idea of the father of a family, any residual element that's left be taken out? Should there be no mother and father? Should the state be entirely responsible for raising the children? As was the case in Plato's Republic, at least for the ruling elite. You don't know who your mother and father is. 
You were born from the earth itself. Um, and I think Plato, part of his point in the Republic was to show how ridiculous the conditions would be to form some kind of a utopia like he described, but I'm not going to get into that. Um, let me just continue here with, with John Dewey on page 468. Uh, he says, he, um, so this is a long sentence that starts on page 467, but he says, but I suppose that everyone who reflects upon the subject admits that it is, it is impossible that the ways in which activities are carried on for the greater part of the waking hours of the day and the way in which the shares of individuals are involved in the management of affairs in such a matter as gaining a livelihood and attaining material and social security can only be a highly important factor in shaping personal dispositions in short forming character and intelligence. So he's definitely saying that it's the duty of a democracy to form character and intelligence and namely make them more and more democratic. In the broad and final sense, all instructions are educational in the sense that they operate to form the attitudes, dispositions, abilities, and disabilities that constitute a concrete personality. This principle applies with special force to the school, for it is the main business of the family and the school to influence directly the formation and growth of attitudes and dispositions, emotional, intellectual, and moral. This time he left out church, but it's definitely the main business of a church to do that. And it seems to me he's got a a grave suspicion against religious organizations that aren't absolutely democratic. And that's, um, it actually is another thing that Dick Tocqueville predicted in Democracy. He said, pantheism, the belief in one's all-pervasive spirit without any individual soul so that there's no hierarchy will have secret charms for people living in a democracy. Because the very idea of a monarch, a supreme being, is not democratic, obviously. And that seems to me where I don't know what John Dewey's personal religious beliefs were but he definitely said the foundation of democracy is faith in the capacities of human nature not the idea of a creator God endowing us with unalienable rights um, so continuing here he says whether this educative process is carried on in a predominantly democratic or non-democratic way becomes therefore a question of transcendent importance not only for education itself but for its final effect upon all the interests and activities of a society that is committed to the democratic way of life. I'm going to move over here to the right-hand column, page 468. The fundamental beliefs and practices of democracy are now challenged as they never have been before. We hear that all the time, but especially this year in 2020. In some nations, they are more than challenged. So he's writing this in 1937. This is just before the outbreak of of World War II. They are ruthlessly and systematically destroyed by the Nazis and the communists. Everywhere there are waves of criticism and doubt as to whether democracy can meet pressing problems of order and security. We saw that all summer in the United States of, in 2020. The causes for the destruction of political democracy in countries where it was once nominally established are complex, but of one thing I think we must, we may be sure, wherever it has fallen it was too exclusively political in nature. It had not become part of the bone and blood of the people in daily conduct of its life. So that, uh, I'm going to just read this last sentence. The democratic idea itself demands that the thinking and activity proceed cooperatively. So the daily conduct of life must be democratic through and through, according to John Dewey. Otherwise, the democracy can collapse as it did in Nazi Germany and as it did in Soviet Russia, which was very briefly democratic before the communists took over. And again, he was saying that the family, business, and the church, and the schools all should be pervaded with a democratic spirit. But I don't see, that I see as kind of overreach because um, the family, is naturally hierarchical with the parents at the top and the children having to be subordinate. To some degree, it's not that the, a good parent is trying to enforce his or her will on the child, but the child needs to be formed. And so I don't see how much democracy can influence that situation. In business, you've got a boss and you've got employees. I mean, if you're the boss, you're going to say, okay, my employees, I've got 10 employees, I hired all you guys, I'm a carpenter and you're going to help me. 
oh, well, we can't take that job because you guys have voted it. Does that seem just? I mean, if you want to have your own carpentry business, go start your own business. And in the church, oh, there's a pope, there's cardinals, there's bishops. Granted, so many horrors have been perpetrated by the Catholic Church and every religious organization that's ever existed and every political organization that's ever existed. If it's existed long enough, it's been responsible, or at least it's been used by corrupt people for evil things. But should democracy necessarily infiltrate the church so that if, if that was the case, you would end up with everyone having to be a pantheist with no hierarchy of any kind of a supreme being and subordinate, no angels, no, individ, no saints, nothing like that. Everyone's equal. I think in most, well, I know in, for example, in, um, you know, in Catholicism, which would be the most patriarchal, hierarchical, anti-democratic form of Christianity, uh, still, there's the idea of the equality of every soul in the eyes of God. So that is the beginning of what Nietzsche called slave morality. That's that worship of equality that the slaves desire, says Friedrich Nietzsche, we saw in Beyond Good and Evil. Um, but how, just to what degree and in what manners would the state have a right in interfering with the family and the business institutions, the schools and the church to enforce a more democratic spirit. What, what exactly is meant by that? I'm sure John Dewey elaborated more, but this is just a, a, a short excerpt. Okay, so this was going over exam five, part A, question one of Plato, Hobbes, Marx, Mill, and Dewey, which presents the better argument over the relationship of the state to society, and part B, explain Dewey's defense of democracy. So. I agree with a lot of what he said, but uh, I think he is inclining towards an overreach with the democratic spirit. But again, as I've said before, with all of these videos, I express my opinion because that's what these questions ask. And but you can express completely the completely opposite opinion. You can even say, "I saw your video, and Professor Desmond, I'm sorry to inform you, I think that you're a you know a, a very." Um, retrogressive force in society and I and I'm gonna do my best to override your opinions that's fine just as long as you support your opinions with short pertinent quotes from the book show to me you read it that you understand what was said you'll get a good grade and that will be that for John Dewey